All right, so amphibians. So we are moving through our classes of vertebrates in the order of their evolution, really. The first vertebrates that had evolved from invertebrate animals were fish, were those jawless fish were some of the first. Um, and eventually a, a, a group of fish split off and started to evolve into the group that eventually became amphibian. And so the word itself, amphibian, it comes from um, two words, ampha and bios, that means double life. So why do you think that was chosen as a name for these vertebrates? Carter? Um, when it's sort of unsample, they cannot go in the water and they breathe water. And then when they go over, they will grow life and breathe oxygen. Yeah, they sort of have two life stages. Okay, an aquatic stage, like a tadpole, for example, and then a terrestrial stage when they can move on to land. So examples of amphibians, some people get some things confused here with amphibians versus reptiles. So what are amphibians? Some examples. Frogs, toads, salamanders. Yeah, those are the, the large groups. So frogs are amphibians that have really thin, smooth, moist skin, generally longer hind legs. Toads have drier skin, bumpier skin, shorter hind legs. Can you get warts from picking up toads? No, no not true. People say that. It's an old wives tale. Not true. Then you have the sal salamanders and newts, which have cows throughout their life. Some are aquatic, some are terrestrial. And salamanders or newts, I think, are sometimes why people get some, have some confusion with reptiles. Because they might look similar to lizards. And there's also this group called the apoda, which um, have no eyes or legs. They look almost like worms. I'll show you a picture of them. There. So there's a wide diversity of amphibians. What's that? A frog. frog. There's poison dart frogs like those that are. Why? Why are often they brightly colored? What does bright colors indicate in nature? Often, right? Poison. Yeah, poisonous. Toads. I like the picture. Of the Salamanders. Yeah, okay, another picture. They can be quite large. Tree frog. I saw these in Costa Rica when I was there. It's a mating tree frog. That's interesting. What's that? Yeah. Um, again, salamanders. A lot of different types of salamanders. That's the apoda. It's like a snake. Yeah, it looks similar to a snake. It's not, though. It's an amphibian. Are they big? I really like that. Yeah, it comes from the yeah, neat varieties of colors and, and shapes yeah, and sizes. Yeah, they wear Uh, can vary in size. All right, so let's talk about some of the adaptations that amphibians have. So unlike the, rep, the um, fish, amphibians do not have scales. Okay? Their body's covered in a relatively thin skin. And one of the interesting things about amphibians is they can actually obtain oxygen through their skin. They can absorb water through their skin. Now, fish cannot do this, obviously, because they have scales, which are waterproof and very thick. Like fish, amphibians, body temperature is what? Cold-blooded. So what does that mean? Remind me of the definition of cold-blooded. Jake? Like they can change their, like their blood temperature to their skin. So, uh, sort of. But don't say 
state can change it because they cannot control their internal body temperature at all. They basically, they're at the mercy of their environment. So if the, um, the they're burrowed down in the soil right now in an area where it's 40 degrees Fahrenheit, their body temperature is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So their body temperature is not regulated internally. Their body temperature um, matches that of their environment. Now is that a benefit? Does that have advantages or disadvantages or both? What do you think, Aiden? Both, because like the advantage is it can kind of live almost like anywhere. Well, not anywhere, but like it can adapt to like easier. Well, actually, amphibians can't live in as many different habitats as a warm-blooded animal. Because once temperatures drop very, very low, their body temperature drops very, very low, and they cannot be active at all. Okay? So they actually can't live in as many places as a warm-blooded animal. See? So it's because, uh, because they're cold-blooded, they don't need to uh, eat as much, so they don't need that much energy. Uh, but at the same time, they're at the mercy of their environment because if they live in an area too cold, they're going to be like dormant and human. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, when it's cold, they have to be dormant because okay, their body slows way down. But the benefit is cold-blooded organisms require much less food. Warm-blooded animals that are maintaining a high, constant body temperature, it takes a lot of energy to do that. And therefore, they need to eat a lot more for a given body weight versus cold-blooded animals. So they can eat much less. Okay. Fertilization is similar to fish in that it happens external. So here you have um, mating frogs and the female is here on the bottom and the female will release eggs and at the same time the male that is on her back will release sperm cells and they will mix together and fertilize However, that's happening outside of the body. So sperm cells are not being deposited inside of the female. This is all external. So it's similar to fish. And then those eggs will develop and hatch outside of the body as well. So they have external development. And here you have some frog eggs. And each little dot there is an embryo. chambers in the fish heart. Come on. How many? Four. No, not in the fish. Right? Two. Two. Two chambers in the um, fish heart. An atrium where blood enters, a ventricle which pumps it out. Amphibians evolved to have three chambers. So they have a right atrium, a left atrium, and then a single ventricle. Does anyone know the benefit of this? Joe? If one part of their heart may stop working, they can use the other part. That's a good thought. Um, that's not quite the benefit, though. See? No, not so much more blood, but it helps to somewhat separate blood. Because the blood that comes from the, lo the lungs or gills is high in oxygen. It comes into the left side of the heart, in the left atrium. The blood that is deoxygenated comes in the right side, into the right atrium. And the blood is kept separate for much of the way. Now, once those the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood get to the ventricle, there is some mixing, but it stays a little bit more separated than in just a simple two-chambered heart. And this blood can get pumped out to the lungs, and this can get pumped out to the body. Now, did I mix up my labeling? No. Why not? Why is that on that side? Oh, It's what? Yeah, why, why, do, why does it look reversed when we look at this on your paper? Because if you were the frog, our right side would be their left. Yes. 
you imagine, whenever we talk about anatomy, we imagine that the organs we're looking at are inside of the organism, and we're looking into it ventral side, it's belly side. So if I were a frog, and that were my heart, okay, that's my right side, this would be my right atrium, this would be my left atrium. So when we look at it on the paper, it seems to be reversed. Amphibians can obtain oxygen in several ways. Because they have very thin skin, they can absorb oxygen through their skin and they have blood vessels just underneath their skin that can then absorb that oxygen. Is that class done? All right, they also have gills in frogs, which metamorphize. Those gills are present in the tadpole stage when they're living in the water, and then they develop lungs in their adult stages of life for obtaining oxygen from the air. The stages of metamorphosis in a frog, we start with an egg, which hatches into a tadpole. Tadpoles have gills and a tail, no limbs. And then as that tadpole matures, it starts to develop legs. Its tail starts to be absorbed, starts to develop lungs, eventually forms froglet, which has both front and hind limbs and lungs, just a little tail bud left, and then eventually that gets reabsorbed into the adult frog. I guess we'll do a slide. So finally, last slide here. Um, frogs do hibernate during the winter, and amphibians hibernate generally in cold um, climates to conserve energy. And during the spring and summer, when they have an abundance of food, they store up energy in this organ called fat bodies. That's these orange organs inside of this frog. And then in the winter, as they're hibernating, that's what they live off of. That provides them with the energy because they're not eating anything. They live off of that stored energy until spring comes. And finally, reproduction, as we talked about, they have external fertilization. They reproduce in the spring. And they release fewer eggs than fish. Fish often release thousands of eggs at once. Amphibians release sort of in the hundreds, usually. And they're in a like jelly-like mass that holds them all together. Have you guys ever found or, or seen frog eggs like in a pond or a stream? You can often find them. And there's this like mass of jelly which keeps them all sort of together where they can be fertilized and then developed. Alright. So I just handed out 